How's it going, everyone? This is Evan back with another episode of Weekly Wire. It is September 3rd, 2024. Joined, of course, once again with Matt. Matt, how's it going? Good, man. Happy uh, post-Labor Day. Did you do anything interesting on your Labor Day weekend? Yeah, so I actually ran a triathlon up north in the, the upper peninsula of Wisconsin. Wow. Uh, me and my buddy ever since come up to Madison a few years ago. I've been doing them every summer, so we got our yearly you know exercise event out of the way and it was really fun we got an airbnb up up in the woods up in the, the upper peninsula uh for the whole weekend and did the race sunday and it was a wow nice, did you do all three legs or did you just do one part of it energetic weekend did you do What's all that? three legs or did you just do one part of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I did all three legs i did my first one two years ago it was a, a shorter sprint triathlon and me and my buddy upgraded it to the Olympic version, which is a little bit longer last year. And then we debated going up again to the half Ironman, but we, we stuck with the Olympic distance again this year. We, we discussed maybe going up to the half Ironman next year, but I don't know. That's Damn. quite a jump. How <laughs> long is the Olympic distance? Yeah, so Olympic distance is it's about a mile swim, uh, 25, 26 mile bike, and then a 10K, so six mile run. So about about three hours is what we usually shoot for. Nothing, nothing crazy when you break out all the times, but... <laughs> You definitely, you definitely burn in a what's, little bit. What's the, the order between running, swimming, biking? So they got they got to throw swimming first, just so you're not gassed at the end and put you in the water and risk drowning and things like that. So the swim is always first, um, and it was actually pretty chilly when we got up there. It was like 59, 60 <laughs> at seven thirty when we it's started. A little cold Sunday, plunge the swim to get you going. It's a little warm. Well, well, the water up the, the the water temperature was actually warmer than the air temperature, oh, surprisingly wow. enough. So when, when I first dove in, I kind of got that shock a little bit of this is kind of cold. But then very quickly, I was like, wait, this is actually warmer than outside, and it wasn't Damn. too bad. But yeah, what about you? How were your How were your Labor Day weekend? How was your Damn, Labor Day weekend? So I I could crush that except for the swim. I would be I would end up last. I would play, <laughs> be playing catch up the whole rest of the time. <laughs> My Labor Day weekend was good, man. I was in Dallas last week giving this. Uh, keynote at this uh horizon summit conference thing um and then i got back and i went out to the beach yesterday i just started dating this girl and uh, i picked her up early for us to go to the beach so we could beat traffic but then we went to the beach (laughs) early and i i looked at the weather the weather is going to be great all day except for like when you're at the beach early in the morning it's so cold so we like went to the beach, we like got all yes. set up, and then after like 45 minutes, we were like, let's uh, get the fuck out of here and go get some brunch, and we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that, that cold wave did kind of, I feel like my plans were the ones that the cold wave benefited, so I was running the last leg of the triathlon in some nice cool weather, but I feel like for most other people across the country yeah. wanted to do, one last warm event of the summer kind of yeah. ruined the plans. Yeah, but other than that, I mean, the day got warm, I got a nice beach day in, got to feel like... You know, one last real summer day at least. So it was good, man. Awesome. Well, I want to start there. Yeah, I know you were down there in Texas for what I believe was an AI cybersecurity conference was kind of the, the main yeah. theme. Tell me more about that. Any fun stories, events, talks come out of the Yeah, it's funny. So this was the Horizon Summit, and it's put on by this group that brought me in a couple months ago for some event they had in New York for investing in the future of AI businesses. And I gave this talk that they really loved. And he was like, could I actually have you come be the keynote to talk about the future of learning at this event we're doing in Dallas, which I went to, but I didn't get a whole lot of context going into it beforehand that it's basically really steered towards cybersecurity professionals. So it was really funny. Everyone else there was talking about cybersecurity and risks and opportunities within that as an industry right now. And so I wasn't really sure how my talk was going to land. So I went up there gave you know a similar talk that I, I tend to give around what are the origins of the crises that we're facing within society today? What do we not understand about well-being? What do we need to actually make our society healthier? And ultimately being like a call to transforming how we lead and how we learn and how we structure organizational cultures. And then at the end, you know, there's space for questions. And there was, there was like, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds of silence. And then this like 65 year old man in the back stood up and he's like, yeah, I have, I have a question like with like an anger in his voice. I was like, oh God, what is about to happen? And he looks over at me and he goes, how, how the hell did you get on this stage is my question. How, how the hell did you get in this room? This, this doesn't make any sense for you to be giving this talk here. And I was like, damn it. Is that how everyone in this room now feels like, I thought I was crushing it. <laughs> and then he's, 
And then his eyes started watering and he started crying a little bit. And he, he said, I just, I need to know because I need to know how to think. I need to know how, I need to know who to think here because you just laid out some things that have never been explained to me. I'm 65 years old and I feel like I have a better understanding around why the hell everything is so crazy right now. And for the first time in a long time, I can actually feel a greater sense of hope. So thank you. That's unreal. Yeah. What, 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 what do you think were some of those biggest things that you mentioned that really resonated with him and really came across as helping him kind of get to that level of understanding? Yeah, a few things, you know, I think one is, you know, I got into a story, you know, you and I have talked about a lot, which is why does our world have this weird paradox within it right now, which is that we are the richest and most technologically advanced humans the world has ever seen, and yet seem to be the most depressed, lonely, and stressed humans of record. And so getting to explain to folks my take on that, which is our rate of technological advancement and our struggle to socioculturally evolve to keep pace and sort of laying that out and explaining, you know, the surge of content delivery and access to information and how innovation was really focused on speed and spread of information for the last few decades. And that has led to this huge crisis of overwhelm and the 24 hour news cycle while the globalization of the economy is happening. And so people's work hours started to turn into all the time people's attention being focused on consuming information and news started to turn from being structured into certain places to being all the time and then 9-11 happening and tw the 24-hour news cycle sort of habit that we picked up then turning into being hijacked by the way that we utilize social media and are just so captured by our smartphones i think that getting explained to folks the first time they hear it is like an aha moment and then you know i get into the six dimensions of empowered well-being and what I see as our six core psychological drives that have been highlighted through the behavior science of the last few decades. And I think that's always helpful for folks to see like, oh, those are like drives within every single person that aren't ever really fully explained to me. And then there's the piece that is really just around connecting all of these different ideas and bits of wisdom and research around health and wellness and how they all fit together that I think is really empowering for folks when they hear it for the first time. But then the, the last thing is always like a story of hope because ultimately, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the alignment problem because that was one of the questions that somebody had. And so talking about how r right now, when you're thinking about AI, the alignment problem is the root of all dystopian technology movies that have AI, right? Like the, the Matrix, iRobot, and it's this idea that as technology and machines or computers get smarter and smarter, we have to figure out how do we design those systems so that they serve humanity rather than try to delete us. And that if you go online and you look up, you know, Sam Altman's take on how you solve the alignment problem, he has interviews where he said, you know, I, I think we're doing a good job at that when it comes to GPT-3 and GPT-4, but we don't really know how to solve that for the next few decades, but we don't have to because AI is going to help us. And how there's this sort of shady story within that, like that I personally don't want to bet on the way that we're gonna keep the machines from becoming harmful is by depending more on the machines to save us. And so that sort of like brings in some doom and gloom. But then I point out everything that I just explained about how we're wired as human beings and what we need is that we are relational creatures and that there's a superpower that comes when we know how to structure and design groups in ways that empower people to know what matters to them, to feel their emotions, to regulate with one another, to make progress while not burning themselves out. And that when you know that, then it becomes a little bit easier 
to buy into my take, which is rather than betting on the technology to save us, I'd rather bet on the potential of humans to group together. And that if all of us in this room can take a little bit deeper responsibility over how we treat the people that we're in relationships with, whether that's our family, our loved ones, our friends, our organizations, our teams, our businesses, that we bring a little bit more attention and care into how we treat people and how we structure the ways that people communicate and collaborate, then that makes those groups more powerful. And that makes those people more powerful. And that gives us greater ability to tackle this challenge of how are we going to hold these technology companies accountable to serving our interests? How are we going to transform the current corporations that run our world so that they actually serve human values because the point is we already have an alignment problem if you look at the ways that walmart or google or microsoft spend their money and then you bring a hundred people into a room and ask them what really matters to them and you ask them to look at how those folks spend their money i mean just Take it from zero to 100. If 100% is you feeling like, yep, you know, when we all agree this is what's good and right, how, how closely do those companies' actions of how they choose to spend their resources align with what you think is good and right? And it's really far off. We already have a massive alignment problem as far as how the most powerful institutions are acting in relation to what we believe to be good and right collectively. And so the point is, the alignment problem isn't some crisis that is looming in the future. It's a crisis that's existing right now. And that's actually a hopeful story because that means all of us are in relationships with people that we can make better. And all of us are parts of organizations and groups of people that we can structure a little bit better in ways that make all of us more powerful at being able to solve the alignment problem we're facing right now. And so that gives you a little bit more like purpose and hope around all the challenges we're facing, which is just a story I feel like we don't get a whole lot of. So much of our public discourse is around what's wrong and whose fault it is. And it's like this blame and complain game. So I think when I when I sort of weave that story in that way, it can be really impactful for folks. Yeah, and it sounds like the the alignment problem that you're discussing goes even beyond just, you know, how AI interacts with humans, but really how humans interact with this very techno forward world, including AI and probably in, including other technologies and social media and how we have all these things that are causing us so much stress and overwhelm. And there's, like you said, alignment problem with making sure AI doesn't run wild, but also there's this alignment problem of how humans best align themselves in the technological age. Um, so, so with that, what do you see um, the, what, what do you really see the relationship look like specifically with AI and humans over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years when we've worked through some of the kinks and we've kind of gotten to the next level of how we interact with these technologies as a culture? Like, what do you see that looking like? <sighs> You know, it's, it's tough. There's there's two different paths that come up in my mind when I think about that question. One is, what would I be willing to bet is going to happen? And what's my most hopeful, optimistic take of what I hope happens, you know? And I think if I'm, if I'm betting, I'm short-term pessimistic and long-term optimistic, which is in the, in the short term, what we're going to see with the surge of AI is the three big problems I talk about all the time. One is concentration and centralization of wealth. Those that are rich are going to get richer. Uh, we're going to see Microsoft and NVIDIA and Google and Apple boom to become even more powerful than they are. And already they're more powerful than most nations in the world uh, and most nations throughout history. And so I think that that's a problem. We're still struggling with how do we regulate social media companies? You know, we've been struggling with that for over a decade now, and we're, we're still not meaningfully impacting that challenge. And so we're not even caught up with trying to solve the problem of how do we hold accountable the biggest institutions with the most powerful technologies pre-AI to actually serving collective good. 
Uh, so we're still struggling with that challenge. And now we have a supercharged version of that with the greatest processing computer power we've ever seen. So I think we're going to see more of that big challenges with concentration of wealth and centralization of power. And the second one is uh, really relevant to that, that group I was talking to last week, which is disinformation, misinformation, fraud, cybersecurity attack. Uh, there, we have all sorts of challenges with that. You know, cybersecurity is constantly playing catch up and so many people are losing their wealth and uh, struggling with keeping their data private and secure already and now they're totally outmatched and outgunned by those that actually want to be attacking them and so we're having to rely more and more on those greatest institutions to actually keep us safe and all of our information and data safe at a time when we actually trust them the least and so i think we're going to see disinformation fraud cybersecurity, misinformation surge and then the one that i think is most disastrous of course is the continued rise of loneliness disorder and addiction and deaths of despair and so in in the short term those are all going to go up because they already are and they have been and so every indication is that there's no reason to believe that those numbers are going to go down and that's a problem it's a it's a problem that when we look at our gdp through the last two decades it has been surging and going up to the right and at the same time, so have suicides, depression, teenagers and young adults struggling with anxiety, addiction, overdose, and mass shootings. How is it possible that we could be so rich and we could have access to so much knowledge, and yet we're causing so much harm with the technologies that we have? And so in, in the short term, that's what I see happening. But we also talked about this at, at this yeah. talk last week, which was, you know, this is sort of and this is the optimistic take, but this is sort of how humans innovate, you know, through cycles that we innovate a new technology and we're not really sure how to utilize it well at first. And so we deploy it in any sort of way that we can. And then we make meaning looking backwards and we see, oh, shit, well, that caused that problem, that caused that problem. And then we problem solve. And so... I'm, I'm really optimistic that we'll, we'll clean that up because I believe in the power of people that we'll be able to look back and say, oh, okay, these are new boundaries we need to create. These are new design foundations and principles we need to make sure are installed from the very beginning and are deployed at every stage with these technologies. And so, you know, I, I think we could go into almost any sector and talk about how AI is gonna innovate that. But I think the, the most pressing and important one is around how we relate with information. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if the last, you know, 200 years, maybe you even argue the last several, several hundred, maybe even thousand years, innovation was really around speed and spread of information, right? Like the, the telegram, the, the printing press, the telephone, internet, smartphone, uh, satellites, social media even, all of that was about being able to communicate faster to more people. And that's great. But now we are overwhelmed with more content than anyone could possibly consume in a lifetime. And so we now have this amazing technology with AI that allows us not just to scale up how much information we can access and how many people's attention we can capture and engage, but actually we can now start to really dive into the question of how do we organize the ways that information is distributed and the ways that we consume information in ways that serve people's individual and collective interests in the best ways. Um, and the point with that then leads into the really hopeful call to action, which is those technologies will not do that automatically. And the companies that build those technologies will not do that automatically. It's a relationship with the users and the consumers and the citizens of the society in which those businesses exist. And so that means we need more empowered groups of people and we need people who are willing to step up as leaders because no systems or processes exist without leaders who are willing to take responsibility for them. And so that means anyone that has impact, influence, or control over any organizational system 
any family, any relationship has an opportunity to impact, to be able to help us as people be better in our role in that relationship, to shape those systems and hold those companies and those people in power accountable. That's really powerful stuff. I agree, lots of different kind of directions you, you can go off of that. Um, if you were, say, someone that's hearing what you're saying and very much relating to kind of the, the stress and overwhelm that, that, that today's society kind of bring up with whether it's social media or rapid innovation and in technology, or you have these, you know, power and centralization vacuums, what would you like really recommend to, to an individual as the best way that they can kind of maneuver this dynamic and, and rapidly changing landscape? Would you point to back to kind of the six core psychological drivers as like a main thing to, to keep in the back of their head and be aware and conscious of those? Or, or what sort of advice would you give to the individual kind of navigating such um, new and unpredictable No, waters? I think it's actually much simpler than that. It's really about a game of attention that through the last few decades, the ways that we've utilized technology have shifted what we pay attention to. So even just think about the things people have public discourse about, whether on Twitter or with their friends, like the things that we're worried about and having conversations about and debating and just shouting over one another about are world challenges or federal policies. Mm -hmm. But the majority of people I talk to especially even the ones that are ridiculously passionate about making their point about some, you know, federal policy or world crisis. They don't know who their city council people are. They don't, they don't, they don't know who their state legislature is. Uh, and so, and quite frankly, they, ha they have a lot of challenges within their immediate relationships, whether it be with their children, with their spouses, with their friends, with their bosses, with their coworkers. And so it's about shifting what we're paying attention to that ultimately rather than being obsessed with this top-down approach of trying to identify who's in power at the top and how do we argue about what policies they should be doing it's about greater personal responsibility who are you where do you exist what do you care about who are the people in your life what job do you have uh, who do you interact with what can you be doing differently where you live so that you are doing more of what you think is right in those places. Where can you be taking activism, not just in social media posts, but in your day-to-day -day life, in your local community? Can we take a greater responsibility over our local life and stop being so obsessed with everyone's global life? And so like, I think it starts there. Yeah, so, yeah, so what do you think has caused that? Because I, I think about that often too, how, you said it very well. Most people are so focused and caught up on and kind of ruled by, in a sense, the things that they really have no control over. Do you think social media is the number one to blame there? Like, what do you, what do you think that is that people are, are so passionate, it seems, these days about things that they have absolutely no control over? Well, ultimately, our deepest drive is connection, right? And so if you walk into a room and everyone is obsessively only talking about certain things, you're going to eventually start to think about and talk about those things too, because you want to mm. connect and you want validation and you want to be heard. And so what's happened is the majority of what's being talked about in the media, not just, you know, mass media, but also like the media on our smartphones, the, the stuff that we consume that then shapes what we think about is about the global world. And so of course, that's what we're thinking about and what we're talking to people about. That ultimately, it used to be you would walk into work and people were talking about what they did that week and that weekend and like some upcoming baseball game in your community. You know, like before the television, like you weren't watching sporting events from all over the world. Like if you wanted to watch a sporting event, you were going to a baseball game that like you could like drive to. And like you were talking about that and you were talking about other people that lived near you and so there was a necessity to talk about your local community because that's what everyone else was talking about. And so I think it's just as simple as we think more about the things that are thrown in front of us. And so we sort of we sort of have fallen into it accidentally where we're just like getting deeper and deeper into thinking about stuff that's actually further and further away from 
the minute details of our lives that really matter. And it, and then it becomes like by comparison, it's like, well, why should I talk to people about, you know, the little details going on in their life when there are genocides happening over there that seem so much more important Mm -hmm. and that are so pressing and so urgent and everyone's talking about them. Um, Surely that that's not as important. And so it's like this, this weird sort of conundrum we've just fallen into that I think is mostly shaped by just the conversations that we're exposed to today and the conversations kids are exposed to today. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of something Peter Thiel, who's been in the news uh, a bit recently, talks about with his uh, or the, the theory of mimetics and how we really are just creatures of imitation. Um, and yeah, if everyone else is talking about things halfway across the world, that's what we're going to be interested in talking about. Obviously, there's massive media conglomerates that have tried to weaponize our, weaponize our attention that you speak of so highly. And I, I couldn't agree more that it's one of the biggest kind of commodities that we all need to very dig- diligently protect in this environment. Um, yeah, and, and, imp- and importantly, yeah, I heard a quote recently. That, that can fall really quickly into like a, a victim and oppressor narrative, right? Like, like yeah. here, here's these massive companies and these massive technologies that are impacting the ways that we're thinking and relating and talking, and it, it can turn into like an us versus them fight when really actually there's, there's – a more optimistic and hopeful story within there, which is there's an opportunity right now. There is greater opportunity than ever mm. to have a real impact with just the way that you choose to live your life, the way that you choose to think about things and talk about things and treat people has greater potential impact for how it can shape their life and impact the world than ever before because there is such a lack and gap of what is actually needed. So when you can actually show up differently in your immediate and local life, it has a a greater impact than it would have before when everyone else was relating that way. And so when you look at it that way, instead of sort of feeling overwhelmed and paralyzed against this like massive force that's so much bigger than you, instead there's really simple calls to action that matter. Yeah, it's a great point and what I would question to that is, you know, individually, yeah, the only things you can control are yourself, is yourself and your own choices and decisions, decisions and attention. Um, but we we're, you know, we we're speaking a moment ago about how um, it is an interesting time that we live in where we do have access to the whole world. And it kind of feels like the whole world has access to us through these social media channels. And if you were to, to talk to someone individually who's struggling with that, yeah, obviously you can say, you know, you can only focus on things you need to focus on, but looking at it culturally on, on a social level, do you think it's possible at this point to, to put the genie back into the bottle in that sense of um, this kind of very large fence that's sort of been built between our biological way of living and this new sort of synthetic um digital um kind of way of living that 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 seems to be causing some some conflicts in like the mental health space and otherwise uh in this country we definitely can't put the genie back in the bottle but also i don't know that we would want to you know like Mm -hmm. you, you look throughout history and most technological advancements even when they cause a little bit of harm, the solution isn't to say, oh my gosh, okay, well, can we bury this and pretend like it was never invented? Uh, well, that, that's not, that's not mm-hmm. the only solution. So I think we sometimes fall into this false dichotomy of thinking it's like, oh gosh, well, things are going to continue as they have been, or we have to totally put the genie back in the bottle. Instead, maybe it's just that we don't have to let the genie be everywhere all the time, all at once. Right. And so it's it's mm. not necessarily an either or of can we put the genie back in the bottle? Cool. Let the genie be out of the bottle. But maybe it doesn't have to roam all around the room at all times. And I think that's possible. Uh, yeah. Building building boundaries and processes and systems that. Can actually shift things. That's totally possible. Yeah, so I want to continue down the, the more optimistic path now then. So I, I know you've spent plenty of years in the, the coaching and, and counseling fields. Um, and, and you mentioned a moment ago how, how the best way to kind of navigate the, this this new terrain uh, is with some, some detailed and honest self-reflection. So 
I'll ask you this. What would you say is sort of the best way to, to perform a, a detailed self-assessment that is an honest reflection of oneself and one's performance and also highlights areas for opportunity or improvement and, you know, kind of shine a light on what works best for that person and the direction of that, that person should go in their individual life. Oh, that's life. interesting. All right. So say more about what you mean by self-assessment and why that matters. Yeah. So I think like we were talking about, we, we live in an age where you wake up, you know, people say that often the first thing they do is check their phone and they're immediately introduced to this world of attention grabbing things, whether it be advertisements or social media posts or the news or the sports highlights, there's all these different things pulling us in different directions. And I think this is sort of an underlying aspect of, of what we're talking about is that it's maybe more difficult today to be truly aligned with oneself, with what one is, you know, really most poised to do or what they're best at or what they genuinely yeah. like, as opposed to what someone is someone else media conglomerate or person or otherwise is telling them that they should like. Um, so really kind of, I guess in a way it would be solving the alignment problem, uh, but for yourself as opposed to an artificial intelligence. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's simple to explain and to map out action steps and hard to do, right? Because changing our behavior is, is hard uh, because it takes, it takes repetition and ultimately we fall back into behaviors we've done in the past because they are familiar. And so when we start to change our own behaviors, it starts to change our own identity and our mind. And it, that, that brings in a ton of unpredictability and, an, and uncertainty. And so even, even if it's simple for me to explain, it'll be hard for anyone to do. But the simple steps really are starting with emotions. So what I find is most people, particularly today, because of the overwhelming stress that everyone else walks around with, and because of the ways that we consume information, we are less aware of what we experience and we have less skills for regulating stress and identifying and understanding our own emotional experience. And so the first starting point for anybody is to develop some sort of practice for just figuring out what you're feeling in a non-intellectual way, meaning actually feeling your emotions. So maybe for some people that's meditating, maybe it's working with a coach or a therapist and like going through trauma work. Maybe it's like building out uh, something like a, like a mood meter where you just take a look at different emotions at like once or twice a day and you ask yourself like, oh, okay, what am I feeling in my body? Uh, do I feel joy? What am, what am I feeling here? Is, oh, I feel angry. Okay, what, what, where do I feel that in my body? like trying to actually strengthen the muscle of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing and regulating your emotions. What do you feel? What does it feel like in your body when you feel those things? Because ultimately our emotions are data. They are signals about what our needs are. So you cannot start to create a plan or take actions that serve your needs and improve your life. If you have no idea what your needs are, you have to know who you are as a biological system before you can optimize yourself. And there are all sorts of practices that can help with that, like walking around outside, getting sunlight, uh, treating your biological instrument of your body with respect by actually like consuming foods and drinking water in ways that actually help you to feel energized, that can make it easier for you to really tune in and understand what your needs are. And so it's, it's starting there. Like what kind of practices can I do that help me be in my body and feel and understand my emotions? So that's step one. And that whatever that exactly is, is different for people. And so whenever I used to work with a ton of clients or when I would train therapists, it was about trying to work with an individual to see what would they be willing to do and what could be really possible for them to be able to start to build out those practices. So that's, that's level one. Yeah. I want to double click on, on one of the, on the, the idea of looking to your feelings. Yeah, first. Please. You, you know, you said it's a, your feelings are sort of data points for helping you regulate your kind of mental well being. Well, but, and, and I would say um, they're not, they're not data we, points we, for we, regulating we, your well being. Your emotions are data points for how you regulate your body. That ultimately you are, you're an embodied gotcha. being. 
And so your mind is, is, a, is a part of that. And so in order for you to actually be the best leader for your life, well, guess what? Your life is lived through your body. And so it, you have to be able to strengthen your ability to feel and understand your emotions so that you can better regulate your body so that you can live a life that is well. Exactly. That's what I was going to kind of have you get at is that sort of connection between the, the mind and the body and how they it, it's a dance between the two. And you say, you know, OK, I'm stressed out. Why should I focus my attention on my body and realize that my stress is in my arm or in my chest? Like, why should I do that? Because like you just said, it, it's it's all connected. And if you listen to your body, then you can recognize, oh, I have maybe some tension in my arm. Like, am I stressed out? Because you've done that work on the flip side of, oh, when I get stressed out, I have the tension in a certain part of my body. Um, and maybe it helps you take the emotion or take the feeling and turn it into something maybe less esoteric when you, when you are able to actually tangibly say like, oh, I get a certain t tension in a certain part of my body when I feel a certain way. Uh, I'd love you to maybe speak a little bit more to this sort of mind body connection that we have and, and how we really um, set that up for yeah, success. Well, there's no separation, right? There, there's no separation between mind and body that ultimately your, your experience of being alive and, and thinking with your mind is rooted in your body. You no longer have a body. Great. Like you don't have an experience. And so letting go of this idea that you can live your life without ever thinking about what your body is internally experiencing is important. And it's, it, it, it's important to note, like, how do we fall into this trap where we don't spend much time or like teach children skills or teach each other skills for actually understanding and just feeling our emotions within our body. It's sort of part of like Western society. Like Western society fell into this rationality trap uh, where I think Descartes sort of, you know, didn't quite go deep enough. Like, I think, therefore I am. That's not quite true. It's, you know, I, I feel, therefore I am. You feel before you think. Your mind creates stories about what your body is experiencing in order to help you to regulate what your body is experiencing. And so if you fall into the trap of just trying to intellectualize and problem solve and, and plan and and rationalize everything like our ability to do that comes from our ability to utilize language which is our greatest invention because it allows us to utilize our brains in amazing ways which is why humans dominate the planet and why you know humans have such great creative potential but it's sort of like if a construction worker decided they were only going to use a hammer. You can't build a good house with just a hammer. You need to be able to put the, t the hammer down every once in a while and utilize other tools. So great, language is an amazing tool. Being able to plan and problem solve and compare and argue is wonderful. And if you do it all the time, then you're just digging yourself into a hole and you reinforce those patterns in your mind. You have to be able to put the problem solving down and go into experiences of observation, awareness, embracing, non-judgment, presence. Can you actually experience what is here now, not just ruminate about what has happened or obsess about planning about what will happen or can happen? And most people don't. They spend most of their time thinking about the future or obsessing about the past. And so strengthening this ability to be present with your emotions not so that you can be an enlightened monk who walks around and can uh, flex how focused you can be, but so that you are actually aware of who you are in this life that you're living. Yeah, one, one more yeah, additional follow-up on that, and then we'll get back to kind of the, the process that you're walking us through. Do you think there is currently a stigma around that idea of you need to be more in the present and you kind of just alluded to maybe the fact that sure, there is with sure. you saying you don't need to be a Buddhist monk and go all the way. But do you still think there's kind of a stigma against this way of thinking in maybe specifically the business world where, no, you, you need that kind of always on hyper, you know, maybe even like force yourself to be stressed out so that you're always either thinking about the future or thinking about the past. And there's kind of a stigma against this more mindful um, executive type archetype. hundred percent. It's It's the... It's the crisis that comes with great success, right? Like when, when an idea works somewhere in some ways, 
uh, people will try to utilize it as much as possible. And then it will get deployed in some ways that uh, really aren't most effective for it. And then people will roll their eyes and say, see, it doesn't work. Like, I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to. They're like, oh, no, no, I can't meditate because like I can't make my mind turn off. And like somebody explained it to me yeah. once. And uh, basically my understanding is that it's supposed to be a practice of me making my mind silent and still. But that's not what it is. Meditation is not a, a stress management practice or a stillness or a quieting your mind practice. It's a self-awareness practice. And so it's been sort of commoditized and it's sort of, uh, you know, got like a life of its own as, as an idea. And so people can kind of roll their eyes. But a, a part of it is because some people utilize mindfulness as an idea or as a practice in the wrong way. And you could, you could swap that out for, you know, any sort of emotions regulation related term that's gotten big. Uh, so that, that's part of it. But the other part of it is also related to this massive distrust and frustration and anger that particularly millennials and Gen Z are walking around with and feeling like the real problems aren't being talked about. Like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. We're having all these conversations about mindfulness and at work, they've given us all access to Headspace. Uh, great. So now I have access to Headspace on my app, but you still have us work 60 hours a week and you email me at 10 PM <laughs> and uh, our salaries haven't increased, even though the company uh, has increased their revenue by 5,000%. And all of that's just going to the CEOs. And I, I can't afford a home when my parents could and 30 year olds are making less money than their parents did for the first time in three generations. And uh, kids that are born today and 25 year olds that are alive today are expected to die sooner than their grandparents did for the first time in a long time. And so it, it can sort of feel like when an idea like that gets really big and people start talking about it, it's like, OK, great. We get it. You're, you're bringing that to the table and you're bringing that to the conversation and that's wonderful. But when you talk about it too much and you're not talking about these other things, there's like a temptation to reject it because now we're really just trying to call attention to this other shit that it feels like you're neglecting. Which I think is yeah, fair. Yeah, it's an interesting right? way of looking at it. I mean, the, the way I see it at this point, like you mentioned all of those negative aspects that we're incurring as a society right now, but it, it seems to be that you know, I mean, you mentioned there's a cyclicalness to evolution of society, and it seems like this new wave of science and sort of way of, of living and, and things of things to pay attention to, um, like mindfulness, it, it seems like this sort of is a kind of potential door out of the, the murkiness of the, the first generation that's dealt with, you know, the social medias and the um, digi di digitization of everything. Um, and so, yeah, of course, it's in its infancy stages, but um, it seems like it's a, a potential door out. Would that be fair 100%. to say? In, in a lot of ways, I, I sort of see it as similar to, you know, with the with the Renaissance and the in Industrial Revolution, we saw this surge of literacy. You know, we suddenly had the printing press and now people needed to learn things other than just a particular trade, whether it was being a farmer or being a blacksmith or whatever it was, that things weren't just about what you could do with your hands. Now you also had to do more with your mind in order to actually be able to just feed your family and live a life. And so literacy became really important. People needed to know how to read so they could understand more complex ideas and communicate with more people so they could be part of the business world. And that was, that was a necessity to evolve as a society to get more people to be literate. Well, now we are overwhelmed with all of the information and data and our attention is being captured. And so we need to build out this emotional literacy, this ability to take greater power over your own attention so that you're not being captured and manipulated by all of the powers that be. And so it's, it's a necessity in order to exist in the future that we're building and the world that we're now in. Wow, that's a that's a really interesting take. And I, I was going to kind of pose a question to get you to flush it out a little bit more. But it sounds like you just answered it. The, the question was going to be, do you think the same way that you know, the printing press and books and literary devices made knowledge work and reading and writing a essential aspect of the workforce? Do you think that AI is going to make being more tapped into your emotional side and your kind of mindfulness state a 
essential in the next stage of the workforce when AI kind of begins to take all of the just non-emotional, non-feeling, but just straight up, you know, binary computational things that humans can do, but obviously the computer does it, does it too. Do you think in that way, like emotional mindfulness is going to be required just like reading and writing was re required when the printing press came out? A hundred percent. 100%. You know, there's this great quote, I forget the guy's name, um, but he was the head of the School of Economics at the London School of Business. And when I was working as an elementary school counselor, uh, fifth graders would come in in a meeting with me with their parents to pick out their classes for middle school. And on the whiteboard in my office, I would write this quote out on the whiteboard. And it was, you know, in the past, work was about muscles. And right now, work is about the brain, and in the future, work will be about the heart. That ultimately, as computers and our technologies are able to do a whole bunch of the things that we had to do manually before, what becomes more important is what the machines are not able to do. And so, again, we're, we're relational creatures. We do not regulate stress in our bodies as individuals. We rely on other human beings. And we can't create value within a business without effectively creating systems for people to collaborate and communicate together. And so that means we need these skills for being able to regulate our own emotions, to direct our own attention, to express our thoughts and ideas effectively, and to help other people regulate their bodies as we create progress together. And so I don't see it as a woo-woo, fluffy experience to dive into increasing your mindfulness or your emotional regulation skills. And I, I don't see it as just a necessity in order to improve your self-development or your own psychology. I see it as the most important and urgent act of service and responsibility for anyone that wants to live in the world today. Powerful stuff. Can't say I, I really disagree too much there, there at the end. It's, it's a very optimistic picture that I think you're painting optimistic, but also knowing that there is work to be done using these skills that we're talking about to kind of dig us out of a hole that we have found ourselves in culturally, totally. um, but starting with the individual and starting with these practices to get each of our own selves out of it so that we can kind of provide those same benefits to the collective. I, I want to ask you one, one last question, um, kind of stepping back a little bit and looking at your role as a COO of an AI company. Um, what specifically looking at it, your role as a CEO of an ad company, like I said, in an, in an age that is changing so much and, you know, working with technology that lots of other people are trying to, to hit big on right now. Um, what would you say are the biggest challenges of, of starting a company in this sort of environment where, you know, everyone's trying to, to be that person that hits it big on this new technology and everyone's kind of figuring it out. I assume it's very fun, it's very fast paced, um, but what are the biggest challenges in respect to that aspect of the industry that you're in? Yeah, you know, starting a business is always really hard, especially when you're a business that uh, requires big upfront investment in order to build out what you're offering, um, because it's, it's, it's hard to collect people together to just get work done. It's hard to then sell potential customers. It's hard to fundraise. It's hard to work the amount of hours and put in the amount of effort that are necessary to really birth a business, let alone then continually innovate and uh, make sure that systems don't fall into becoming ineffective or broken or at worst harmful. So it's, it's always hard. I think the, the biggest challenge, particularly for like an early stage company like us, is there's so much that you can do when you're, when you're starting out that you don't have the forcing functions of having certain structures that already exist of things that are working that then become limitations around your decision-making process of what you should work on uh, or what needs to be prioritized. And so you, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And so being really rigorous around evaluating what is currently happening within our business, what's our current plan, uh, what sort of experiments or efforts are we currently executing? What did we recently execute? What did we learn from it? What should we iterate? What should we continue? What should we stop doing? Uh, what should we double down on? That's a constant thought process. And the, the biggest challenge is around how do we 
create a system for ourselves that, so that we are doing that well consistently. How about just the, the, the story that, that you want to paint too, that also kind of provides the, 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 the window for, for your company to, to be a viable one and be one that, that solves a problem. How does that kind of weigh in on, um, your focus area of really being able to, to tell that story of why this, this specific company is needed. Um, well, the, the, as opposed the, to the just sto- like building the story it itself, like it. how, how much weight do you put in, in the story and, um, what does that kind of look like behind the scenes? As yeah. I mean, at, for an early stage company, everything is about story and relationship because ultimately, again, you, you don't have a whole bunch of results or, uh, substantial products to be able to show people and, and let it speak for itself. And so your ability to communicate what you're doing, to understand what a potential investor, a potential customer really wants and needs, and to be able to paint a hopeful story about what you can offer being valuable to them is everything. Uh, and and really, that that's all somebody is buying right now, is the, the story of what we can do, and then looking at what we currently have and seeing... Does that line up? And do I believe in the potential of what you are building that it will continue to give me more of the value that I believe that I need? So, you know, being able to understand what someone wants, being able to communicate what you're doing and being able to do that in a way that really resonates and, and motivates action and pulls people together is crucial. And ultimately, we're, we're lucky that, you know, both Matthew and I, that's that's our bread and butter. You know, we, we are storytellers and relationship builders. And so that, that, that part is something that we're really confident about and is very much in our comfort zone. So that, that's not necessarily the hardest part for me. The, the hardest part is really creating systems that then enhance our product and serve our customers' interests and that we are iterating frequently enough on the right things at the right time. That's the biggest challenge. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And I assume the the story you said of yourself, but also I think you were kind of alluding to the the industry at large. How every, the the predominant thing being sold right now in the AI market is, is the story of why a certain service or product is needed. Um, would you say that that is sort of due to the relatively slower, um, maybe? adoption or implementation of AI solutions at scale, like at, at the enterprise level right now. And so because maybe things are a little bit slower to really be implemented, we're, we're still sitting at the, the level of, um, of you know, telling that story and, and making that pitch of which one will eventually cross that finish line. Um, would, would you say that is the case or? Um, Somewhat, in, in a lot of yeah, ways, it's, we'll, we'll it's almost there. always story, right? Like th- think about Facebook's early days. Sure. Like the, People were investing into a story. We are going to connect the world. Oh, okay. How are you going to do that? Well, we've started on college campuses. We've given them access to this platform where they can share photos and update relationship statuses and like talk about what they're doing in an engaging way. And we, we're going to win users and, and spread access. And so investors were investing in a story of what that technology could do and what it could become. And users were buying into a story of, oh, this could give me more connection. This could be fun. This could give me more status. Uh, but ultimately, when you're first signing up, like no one's walking you through an extensive demo and then talking you about all of the things you care about in your life and then selling you on it. Uh, you're not looking at it and then weighing it and like running calculus on how it's going to improve your life. You're buying into a story. Mm. Yeah, and, and especially considering the internet was, you know, pre-2000 and it wasn't really until Facebook in the late 2000s that really got the social media ball rolling. So clearly indicating that there was sort of a lag between in, in creation of the platform that would host these new products and services. When do you think we'll sort of see that happen with AI, right? Obviously, we have kind of the internet equivalent when, when GPT came out and there was that big watershed moment with the Transformers and everything in, in the late 2010s. And now we're kind of in that storytelling and development of ideas state. When do you think we'll really start seeing some widespread at scale implementations uh, of AI either at the consumer or, or business level more so than we've already I, seen? I think there's a lot happening right now that we just aren't able to see the impact of yet because we need enough time sure. to then really be able to like have the metrics then show us what the impact has been. 
So I think I think two or three years from now, we're going to get a clearer story on how the innovations from really harnessing LLMs and the the different computing power that we've deployed over the last few years have really impacted uh, various business operations and various things people are doing in their lives. Uh, I think there's all kinds of amazing things that really we only we only get story of right now just because we haven't had enough time to measure what the impact has been to then be able to utilize metrics and say, look, this is what's happening. So I think I think two or three years from now, we're going to have a much more extensive understanding of what that has been. Uh, the challenge with that is uh, there's a ton of inefficiencies that are going to sneak through. Uh, and, you know, some people would make the case that there's there's more inefficiencies that are going to happen than there are productive and valuable mm. things. And, and we don't know. We're all betting. Right. That's what that's what the market is. We're we're, we're betting on what's what's going to work. And right now the market is betting big that there's going to be huge value that's going to be generated by NVIDIA and Microsoft and OpenAI and Apple. And so right now, most people believe that there's going to be a shit ton of value created, at least by the big players. What I think is going to be interesting is I do, too. I think I think that's going to happen. What I'm going to be really interested in is who these smaller and middle sized players like us are that happen to find a very specific niche of a problem that wasn't being solved before LLMs that now is able to be solved in a really innovative way that really drives value and, and really like turns on some beacons of hope for us around things that we can shift societally that we didn't know were possible and that we really can't quite understand until we see more of these businesses trying to scale their companies and their products and their services to then be able to see, oh, well, what has the impact there been? And that'll be really interesting to see. Like, who, who found a very specific niche and was able to scale up and serve that niche and solve some problems in a really innovative and creative way? Well, fingers crossed. And, and I think Mattermore will be one of those companies that kind of ushers us into this new digital age and AI renaissance. Matt, another great conversation. Anything you got for the people before we wrap up here? Yeah, the, the, the thing I would say to the people is the same thing that I say when I, I go to close my talks, which is right now there is greater opportunity than ever before for you to matter, for the actions that you take in your day-to-day -day life and the ways that you treat the people that are within your world for those actions to matter and to really have the sort of impact into shaping the future that you want to see. Uh, and it's important to remember that. Awesome. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week for another episode of Weekly Wire. Matt, thanks again for another great conversation. Talk to everyone Evan, later. Catch you later. Bye everybody.